You've probably seen a shockwave effect pop up in any number of your favorite games. If you've ever wondered how it's done, you're about to find out. In this video, we're gonna explore some basic image distortion techniques used in shaders. Shaders can produce some really amazing effects, but if you're still quite new to shaders, they can be really confusing to put into practice. By the end of this video, you'll not only have made this awesome shockwave effect, but you'll also understand the image distortion techniques used, so you can tweak this effect to exactly how you want and apply these techniques to come up with unique effects of your very own. If you're completely new to shaders, essentially shaders are just bits of code that run on the GPU in a highly parallel way, which can make them a bit tricky to understand while you're still getting used to them. If you'd like a good starting point, you can check out my introduction video to get yourself up to speed with the basics. Most commonly, shaders are used to calculate the color of every pixel on the screen, and that's exactly how we'll be using them today. By the way, all the code from this video is freely available in the description. I'm using P5.js for this because it makes it really easy to share the code with you. The link will open up in the online editor, which means you can edit and run the code without having to download or set up anything. P5.js shaders are written in GLSL, which is one of the two most prevalent languages for writing shader code, and the concepts we'll go over are highly transferable to whatever framework, engine, or environment you happen to be using. To get started, I've got some empty shaders set up. The vertex shader is the standard one I use for full screen effects. It just takes the quad I'm rendering and makes it full screen. One thing to note here, especially if you've watched my introduction video, is that I'm using a newer version of GLSL, as you can see in the version tag here. Things will mostly be the same as you're used to, but they've done away with the attribute and varying keywords, and you now use the in and out keywords instead. Use in when it's an input to the shader, like the position of a vertex, and use out when it's the output, like the fragment position that will be passed from the vertex to the fragment shader. The fragment shader will label the same variable as an in variable because it is an input into the fragment shader. All right, with all that out the way, let's get into some image distortion. To be able to distort an image, we of course need an image to distort. To pass an image into our shader, we can create a new uniform sampler 2D, and I've creatively named mine Image. If you're doing this as an effect in a game, you'll probably want to pass in the most recently rendered frame that you want this post-processing to apply to, but I'm just going to use a static image. To get the image displaying in the output from our shader, we'll need to sample the image, and we can do that with the texture function, which expects a sampler 2D, which is the image, and a position, which is where the image should be sampled. We can use the texture position, which was passed in from the vertex shader for this position. We can then set the output color, which is also using the new in and out syntax, by the way, to the sampled color. And when we do, you can see we now get our image being displayed on the screen, which isn't very interesting at all. Where it does get interesting, however, is when we start messing around with the position we're sampling from. Before we continue, I'd just like to say a quick word from this video's sponsor, CodeCrafters. If you're wanting to improve your programming but are struggling to come up with project ideas, then CodeCrafters has got you covered. They have a great range of projects such as making your own BitTorrent or an interpreter from scratch that you can complete in a huge variety of languages with new projects and languages being added all the time. The project guides teach you all the data structures and algorithms needed to complete the challenge, but the implementation is entirely up to you so you can practice writing complex software that will help push your skills to the next level. Not only do you get to recreate well-known software solutions, you'll also learn how they work at a very hands-on level. So if you want to improve your software engineering skills, check the link in the description to try CodeCrafters for free today and get 40% off if you decide to sign up for everything that they have to offer. Thanks to CodeCrafters for supporting the channel. Now back to the video. A very simple and easy distortion we can do just to get us started is create an offset vector and set the X to the sign of the Y position with some scaling and tweaking. If we add this offset vector to the position vector when we're sampling the image, you can see the image becomes wavy. You've probably already figured out what's going on here to produce this effect, but I'll go over it just because it's really the fundamental mechanism for creating image distortion effects. If we just look at a single pixel, by adding an offset to the position we're sampling, instead of showing the correct pixel from the image, we're instead showing the pixel from over here. By using the sine function on the Y position to calculate the offset for the X position, as we move down the image, each row of pixels is being offset in a sine wave, producing the wavy effect. We're of course not limited to just the X direction for our offset. If we create a similar sine wave offset in the Y direction using the X position of the current pixel, we can get waves going in both directions. In this way, by sampling slightly offset portions of the image, we can create any number of image distortion effects. 
The waves are pretty cool, but they're a long way from the shockwave effect. In the previous example, we were conceptualizing the offset as a shift in terms of their Cartesian coordinates, as in an X offset and a Y offset. What we're going to do now is start thinking about the offset in terms of a direction and a magnitude. Before we get stuck into it, let's figure out exactly what we're trying to achieve with this effect. We want an expanding ring that has distortion around the edges and everywhere else should be left undistorted. We want that distortion to occur along the line that connects the center of the effect to the current pixel's location. The pixels on the outside of the ring should be pushed away from the center while the ones on the inside should be pulled towards it. This should create a sort of bulging effect inside the bounds of the ring. We'll look at figuring out the direction of our offset first and then we'll tackle the magnitude. I've created a center vector, which for the moment is set to the center of the screen at 0.5 in the X and Y, but this vector is actually telling us the center of the shockwave effect, so we'll be able to move this around later. Having this center vector allows us to figure out the direction from the center of the effect to the current pixel, and we can do this by simply subtracting the two vectors like this. With this, we've already figured out the direction for our image sampling offset, but now we need to figure out how far in that direction we want to go. We'll get to animating the effect in a little bit, but to get started with the shockwave, we're just going to get it working on a static circle first. We want the pixels within a certain range of the edge of a circle to be distorted, and to do that, we're going to need to know how far from the edge of that circle we are. And this, my friends, is a job for sine distance fields. The term may sound scary, but if you remember back to my intro to shaders video, basically it's just a function that describes a shape by telling you how far a given point is from the outline of that shape. You get a negative value if the point is inside the shape and a positive value if it's outside, and that's why it's called a signed distance field. The SDF of a circle is nice and simple. We just subtract the radius of the circle from the distance between the center of the circle and the pixel position. Serendipitously, the direction vector we've already calculated is a vector from the center of the circle to the current pixel, so we can use that in the SDF, and for the moment, we'll just use a radius of 0.2. An important thing to note here, which is on a bit of a tangent, is the aspect ratio. Since the coordinates in a shader are normalized, that is, they go from 0 to 1, if your output is not a square, then your SDF circle will be stretched along the longer side. A simple fix to this is to pass in a uniform vector, which I've called aspect, with 1 as the x and the width of the screen divided by the height of the screen in the y. When we're calculating the SDF, we can then divide the direction vector by the aspect vector, which will correct the distortion and give us our circle. We'll store the resulting SDF value in a float called D and we'll use that as the magnitude of the offset. Oh, and by the way, you'll need to then make sure you normalize the direction vector, otherwise the magnitude we're calculating won't actually be the magnitude being used in the offset. It's important to do this after we've calculated the SDF though, because normalizing sets the vector's length to one, but the SDF calculation uses the actual length. So if we sample the image using our direction and magnitude for the offset and output the result, you can see we're not quite getting a shockwave look. And this is because we're not doing anything to prevent the distortion outside the area of the ring. We can fix this by using the smooth step function to create a mask. If you're unsure about the smooth step function, then again, check out my intro to shaders video. We can define being inside the ring as being less than some distance from the edge of our SDF circle. Since the SDF is negative inside the circle, we'll want to use the absolute value of D for this particular calculation because we only care about the actual distance to the circle's edge, not which side of the edge we're on. To set the upper bound of how far the ring extends from the edge of the circle, or more simply, the width of our ring, we can set the upper edge of the smooth step function. I'm just going to set it to 0.05 for now. This will return a 1 for any pixel that is further than 0.05 units away from the edge of the circle. We can set the lower edge to be zero, so any pixel that is directly on top of the circle's edge will return a zero from the smooth step function. If this seems like the inverse of what we want for our mask, that's because it absolutely is. We wanna be able to use this value to zero out the magnitude when we're outside the ring, but the smooth step function we've written is returning zero for inside the ring. We can fix this nice and simply by subtracting the smooth step result from one to invert it, and we can multiply the magnitude by this whole expression to get our masked result. And by doing so, we get our first glimpse of the shockwave effect. In fact, it's now all just about making it a bit prettier, but before we do that, let's quickly recap how this effect is working. Each pixel is sampling our image, and by default, we're sampling the image at the correct position, but some of the pixels are being offset, which is what makes them look distorted. 
We've created the offset by defining a direction and a magnitude or distance along that direction for the offset to occur in. To figure out the direction, we're simply finding the vector that points from the center of the shock wave to the current pixel. For the magnitude, we're using the SDF of a circle to know how far we are from the edge of the circle. If we're too far away, we're using a mask to zero out any magnitude, which means there's no offset and no distortion occurring. If we're close enough to the edge, then we're using a slightly smoothed out version of the SDF value, thanks to the smoothness of the smooth step function, as the magnitude of our offset. Since the SDF value is positive if we're outside the circle, the offset is being pushed away from the center on the outer edge of the shock wave ring. And because the SDF is negative if we're inside the circle, the offset is occurring towards the center on the inside of the shock wave ring. Hopefully that all makes sense to you. If not, just drop a comment with any questions you've got and I'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. All right, let's spruce things up a bit. First on the list is adding a bit of movement. Currently, the circle we're using for the shockwave has a fixed radius of 0.2 units. To animate the effect, we want the radius of the circle to start at zero and increase up to a given size. To achieve this, let's create a new uniform float called T that will describe how far through the animation we are. By convention for these sorts of things, T should be a value between and including zero and one. This makes it nice and simple to set a maximum radius. When the animation is at the end, T will be one, so we can simply multiply T by our maximum radius. I'm gonna use a constant float for this, but if you wanna be able to control it, you can just as easily set this up to be a uniform. So let's get rid of the hard-coded 0.2 as the radius in our SDF calculation and replace it with our T value multiplied by the maximum radius. And for the moment, I'm setting T based on the mouse's X position, which lets me scrub through the animation. If we have a look at the result of this change, you can see the circle expanding nicely as I move my mouse to the right. You can also see, however, that when my mouse is all the way to the left, representing a T value of zero, there's already a bit of distortion visible. And this makes sense when you think about the calculation we're doing. When our SDF has a radius of zero, it's effectively a point, but our effect works in a band around the edge of our circle, 0.05 units on either side to be precise. So what we're seeing here is the outer half of the ring being distorted. This might not be an issue for you, but I'd like to have a T value of zero not show any distortion at all, and the same goes for a T value of one. That way the animation is nice and smooth. To fix this, I'm gonna move our current magnitude calculations into a function which I've called get offset strength, which we need to pass our T value into as well as our direction vector. Inside that function, we can add in our SDF calculation as well as the smooth step mask that we figured out earlier. Now what we wanna do is add another mask to the magnitude for the first little bit of the animation as well as for the last little bit, which we'll also do using the smooth step function. To smooth out the intro, we can use a first edge of zero and a second edge of 0.5 with T as the third parameter. What this will do is for the first 5% of the animation, the magnitude of the distortion will slowly increase from zero up to full strength. So now when my mouse is all the way on the left, we have no distortion at all. And as I move it to the right, the distortion increases at the same time as the ring expands. Awesome. Now let's tackle the end of the animation, which can be achieved in a very similar way. For this mask, I'm gonna set the lower edge at 0.5 and the upper edge at one. We'll need to invert this result just like we did with the original mask because we want the distortion to decrease as T goes from 0.5 to one. So we can do the same one minus trick as before. I start this ramp down at 0.5 because I suspect that a shockwave would start losing power pretty rapidly, but all these values are something that you can tweak to personalize this effect for your own needs. With the outro smoothed out as well, this is starting to look pretty good. However, the effect is still locked to the center of the screen. So let's create a center uniform vector and remove the old one that was hard coded to the middle of the screen. I've got it set up now so that when I click, the center is set to my mouse position and the T value is still linked to the mouse's X position like before. And we can see the effect moves nicely to any new position that we give it. Now, instead of setting the T value based on my mouse's position, I can make it increase over time and reset it every time I click the mouse, and we have a very usable shockwave animation, but there's still more we can do. Before we do though, I just wanna show quickly that my T value increases linearly behind the scenes, but when I pass it into the shader, I'm actually raising it to a power of less than one so that the animation is rapid to start with and then slows down. And this is called an easing function. And again, this is something that you can play around with. And in fact, you should check out easings.net for some really great inspiration on different easing functions you can use. All right, a really cool effect that we can add really simply to this is some chromatic aberration. 
If you've seen my glitch effect video, this will be familiar to you, but chromatic aberration is just a fancy term that essentially means that different colors are distorted slightly differently. This can occur naturally in lenses because the different colors of light are on slightly different wavelengths, and so they travel through lenses on slightly different paths, leading to a separation of colors. Since we've extracted our magnitude calculation into a nice neat function, we can easily calculate a different distortion for each of the three color channels. I've created three new floats, one for red, one for green, and one for blue, and I've used very slightly tweaked T values for each of them. We can then use these three different values to offset the texture sampling and use a single color channel from each of the samples before putting them together in our final color. Doing so gives our shockwave a bit more punch. Another quick and easy way to make the effects stand out a bit more is to add some shading. We can do this really easily by adding the magnitude into the final color. Since the SDF and therefore the magnitude are positive on the outside of the ring, the shockwave will be lightened there and it's negative on the inside so it's darkened. And this can really help to make the effect pop. One last thing before we wrap this up. We're using an SDF of a circle for our effect, but there's absolutely no reason why a differently shaped SDF wouldn't also work. For example, I've changed mine to use a box SDF and you can see that our solution has no problem using that shape. Of course, there are so many more interesting SDFs than a box and I'd really encourage you to play around with them. This would not be a shader video without mentioning the god of shaders, Inigo Quiles. I've linked his article on 2D SDFs in the description, but check out his entire website and YouTube channel. They're an absolute goldmine. So there we have a pretty sick looking shockwave effect that you can use in all sorts of scenarios for a bit of visual juice. And just a reminder, the code for this effect is linked in the description, so go and tweak some values and play around with it. I'd love to see what you do with it, so make sure you join the Discord server and share your stuff there. If you found this video useful at all, it would be wonderful if you could give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you want to see more like it. Thank you so much for watching, happy coding, and I hope to see you again soon.